Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, that we should live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Words take from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A young Catholic woman named Elizabeth married an unbelieving man, a doctor, a physician named Dr. Felix Lesur at the turn of the 20th century. They were married at Paris at a Catholic church, for the good doctor had promised to respect the religion and faith of his wife. But immediately afterwards, Dr. Lesur tried to break down the faith of Elizabeth. In addition to practicing medicine, he became an editor of an anti-Catholic and atheistic newspaper in Paris. Elizabeth, for her part, reacted by dedicating herself to the study of the true faith. She built up a library of good Catholic books in her home. But the doctor, in turn, built up his own atheistic library in the same house. This, of course, was a source of tremendous division between the two, but Elizabeth loves Felix would still grow daily nonetheless. She knew that it was proper to love her spouse, to even lay down her life for her spouse in order to save his soul. In May of 1905, Elizabeth lay dying. A sudden and very serious sickness had come upon her at a very young age. She said to her husband, Felix, when I am dead, you will become a Catholic, and you will become a Dominican priest. Felix responded in a very defensive way. Elizabeth, you know my feelings. I have sworn hatred of the church and sworn hatred for God, and I shall live and I shall die in that hatred. But Elizabeth only repeated her prophecy before passing away. After many tears and grief, Felix eventually discovered Elizabeth's last will and testament. It read the following, quote, On the day that I die, I shall have paid the price. You have been bought and paid for, Felix. Greater love than this no woman hath, and that she should lay down her life for her husband. You see, Elizabeth had generously prayed for suffering. She had prayed for sickness and even for death itself in order to bring about the conversion of her spouse. But Dr. Lesur, a man of modern science and an atheist, simply dismissed this as the mere fancies of an overly pious woman. To forget his grief, Felix took a trip to southern France, to the place where Elizabeth and he had had their honeymoon. And the doctor eventually stopped in front of the church that his wife frequently prayed at during that honeymoon. And Elizabeth's voice seemed to speak to him. Felix, go to Lourdes. Yes, he was being told to go to that place where our Blessed Mother had appeared to St. Bernard at Subiru some 18 times and left to all men both miraculous waters and a place of healing for both spiritual and corporal infirmities. Felix went to Lourdes, to that shrine of our Blessed Mother, to that place of healing. The doctor had actually written a major work against Lourdes in the past, seeking to prove that all the miracles were false and mere superstition. But while standing before the Grotto of Our Lady, Dr. Felix Lesur, atheist and leading figure in the anti-clerical, anti-Catholic movement in France, was given the gift of faith so completely, so fully, that he needed no convincing, no argumentation. Soon the good doctor would become a Catholic and would eventually enter the Dominican religious order and be ordained a priest of God. Felix, when I am dead, you will become a Catholic and a Dominican priest. On the day that I die, I shall have paid the price. You have been bought and paid for, Felix. 
Greater love than this no woman hath, than she should lay down her life for her husband. A woman's generous and sacrificial love, a woman's heroic virtue, along with Our Lady's necessary and omnipotent intercession, had given life to a soul that was dead. Another woman, nearly a contemporary of Elizabeth's, was the complete opposite. This other woman, whose name was Margaret, Margaret Sanger to be exact, was not so life-giving, she was not so generous, she was not so fertile, whether spiritually or physically speaking. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood of America, as well as a follower of the eugenics movement, which brought the motto of the jungle, survival of the fittest, into human society, completely immersed in the pernicious notion of evolution. Margaret and other eugenicists wished to treat men like horses, always trying to improve the breed, you know. Only the fit, only the talented, only those with a good gene pool, read Caucasians, were worthy of life. Yes, instead of being heroic in virtue, Margaret Sanger was extreme in vice, including much promiscuity. You always want to trace the roots of the Planned Parenthood contraceptive movement. It's promiscuity. And to protect and expand her selfish lifestyle, Ms. Sanger promoted a culture of death, the culture of non-sacrifice, a contraceptive mentality with birth control and sterilizations. In league with Adolf Hitler and other eugenicists, Ms. Sanger stated that Quote, birth control will create a race of thoroughbreds, unquote. In other words, a superior race, a better people, an Aryan people, ubermenches, supermen. According to Margaret Sanger, the strategy for Bland Parenthood was to have a, quote, rigid policy of sterilization and segregation of those in the population who are tainted, but perhaps her utter lack of sacrificial love and generosity could best be shown in the following phrase. She once said, The very types of people which in all kindness should be obliterated from the population have been allowed to reproduce themselves. But I need to mention one more quotation from Margaret which shows the key connection, the necessary connection between the contraceptive mentality and abortion. If one is against babies before they come into the womb, then one will probably be against babies once they arrived in the womb. It's pretty obvious. Decades before the infamous decision of Roe versus Wade that legalized the murder of the unborn, Miss Sanger stated, women have the right to create and they have the right to destroy. Add to this statement the one made just a few years back by the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who clear, clearly affirmed that the purpose of Roe versus Wade was, quote, to diminish populations of those groups that we don't want to have too many of. Eugenicism still lives. The legacy of Margaret Sanger is one of self-absorbed narcissism, as well as support for a culture of death and the sin of racism. This coming Wednesday, July 25th, 2012, will mark the 44th anniversary of the release of Pope Paul VI's famous encyclical, Humanae Vitae, which simply stated and repeated, albeit in a modern way, what the Church has always taught about the marital act. 
And even better and more traditional encyclical on this topic was penned by Pope Pius XI, known as Casti Canubii. It's much more Thomistic. But in the former encyclical, Pope Paul VI condemned contraception as being intrinsically evil. In other words, there were no circumstances whatsoever outside of violent rape that would somehow make the use of contraceptives licit to prevent conception. Miss Sanger, on the other hand, wished to purify, she said, to purify relations between men and women from the consequences of having children. Physical relations totally disconnected from the notion of reproduction. Therefore, the very nature of the marital act is destroyed. Sanger, Planned Parenthood, and the whole contraception crowd have emptied marriage of its very purpose, thus leading to sexual license and perversion. For if relations can be divorced from babies in the world of contraception, then anything goes. Sodomitical acts, pornography, self-abuse, acts that come to completion outside of the full marital embrace, cohabitation. All of this will go from something unnatural, sinful, even disgusting, to just another lifestyle or another option in the cafeteria of morality. Contraception is first and foremost unnatural. It's a sin against nature. That's what the church has always taught. It is against the nature of marriage and against the nature of man and woman. Imagine a person eating only for the sake of uniting with food, just for the pleasure of it, but then rejecting the purpose of food as nourishment by regurgitating it. Such a person would be seen as in need of help. Sickness was present. And yet those who seek only pleasure and union in relations while rejecting the reproductive aspects are considered responsible. This is truly twisted thinking in the modern world. Is being with child now considered a disease? Is fertility gone from being a blessing from God to being a curse? Do you need to take medication like a pill in order to avoid this sickness of pregnancy? Beasts, lower animals, will never have trouble reproducing. They're programmed. The good Lord will continue each of these species in the animal kingdom just through this blind instinct which leads these beasts to bring forth life. But this is not true with human beings. No, men and women, husband and wife, freely cooperate with our good God in carrying on the human race. In other words, whether or not a child comes forth, the child meant to see God face to face, depends both on God as well as the generous and sacrificial love of the spouses. The beasts are dumb instruments that God uses without free involvement. On the other hand, spouses are either willing or they're unwilling instruments in the divine plan of Most High. Remember, husband and wife just don't reproduce like dogs and cats. We're different in kind. Rather, we procreate in union with the good Lord. The couple will bring forth the material part of a new child while the Most High will create from nothing a spiritual and immortal soul meant to see God face to face. Every married couple is called to obey the command, be fruitful and multiply, the first commandment God ever gave. Some might have no children or smaller families, for fertility is a gift. Some might be called to have larger families. Whatever the case may be, spouses must accept a mission to be ordered to and generously disposed to giving life. You know, one of the reasons I embraced the traditional Latin Mass and sacraments exclusively, as well as the whole traditional movement, because not just because of doctrine, not just because of the beauty of the liturgy, but also because of the shining examples offered by many 
traditional Catholics in regards to Catholic family life. The generous efforts to bring forth life, both naturally and supernaturally, is a great example for a priest who is called to be a bridegroom to the church and a father to, hopefully, many spiritual children. With marriage under constant barrage from the culture of death, your witness of heroic virtue is so necessary. And so let the sacrificial love of Elizabeth Lesseur be our example. The good Lord desires cooperation in his divine plan to populate heaven with countless children of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.